rather early here on the east coast of the United States, but uh, a more reasonable time uh, over in the UK. <laughs> good morning. Uh, this morning we have joining us uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Mark Wallace, who um, if you guys don't know, uh, you may have run into um, some of his um, sort of pursuits at the Tower of London and various other uh, royal palaces uh, through a company called Past Pleasures. But Mark is also a um, avid collector of um, 18th and 19th century menswear, um, and later too, I think. Um, and so this morning, um, I thought what we would do uh, is uh, Mark had um, sent me some photos from his collection. Uh, we could talk about the pieces that uh, we had that we that we will see on the screen here, um, and. Um, sort of go through a bunch of waistcoats um, that, that he owns. Uh, as Mark has a pretty incredible collection of waistcoats. Um, <laughs> uh, and other things. And, other and, things. and other, oh, lots of other things. Lots of other <laughs> things. So um, maybe to get started here, Mark, um, let me ask you, um, what got you into collecting uh, menswear versus, um, you know, anything else? <laughs> when I was um, a, a teenager, Neil, <coughs> years ago, um, I was first into military uniforms, yeah. um, painting model soldiers, the rest of it, and and, uh, and then my interest sort of widened uh, to include civilian dress of the 18th and 19th century. Um, <coughs> so, so, and I was using my pocket money, and then when I was a student, any holiday earnings I could get on these, um, as much costume as I could get. And in those days, in the 1970s, Neil, at all the major auction houses in London, people were not interested in the men's clothing. Mm -hmm. Women's clothes, sack pack dresses, cost a fortune. Kimonos, good ones, would cost a fortune. But in the 70s, I was buying embroidered court waistcoats for five or six pounds. Wow. Now they're five or six hundred pounds. Yeah, so um, there, there seems to have been, unless it's attached to a, a, a famous person, not much interest. And you would get whole bags full of incredible stuff and pull things out and think, oh my God, there's that inside there. So that was how I spent all my, all my, you know, meager earnings, I suppose. Plus, I was also a reenactor at the time when I went to art school during English Civil War period. Um, so history has always fascinated me, and that's the genesis of past pleasures to bring history to life through, through costume interpretation. Many happy years spent with CW doing just that, which is why we know each other. But the collection keeps growing. As it's harder to find the stuff these days, but yeah. the men's clothing is interesting to me because I'm a man and I, I like women in the costume, but I don't collect women's costume. So I collect men, civilian and military. And I think in that respect, I'm fairly unusual to get both those strands. Yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty rare. I and mean, most folks, I mean, collecting costume in general is very rare, you know, because it takes up a lot of space. Um, and yeah. you know, a lot of folks just don't, a lot of collectors don't, don't invest the time in it. Because it's not also really usable, you know, like somebody who, <laughs> who, uh, who collects furniture or uh, ceramics per se. You know, it's one of these things that uh, we still have to keep it from pests and store it, uh, mm -hmm. which just becomes a you know a huge problem because <laughs> it takes up oh. so much space. Oh, it does. Yeah. <laughs> do you uh, do you recall your first 18th century waistcoat that you purchased? Well, I recall the first thing. I'm going to turn the heat off for a minute. Hang on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I ever bought was a a um, uh, an officer's um, frock coat from 1860. Okay. Uh, and I was so thrilled and I put, I put it on, I was 15, 14, 15, put it on and it was photographed and I was imagining myself in that. So that's the first, um, the first coat and then the first waistcoat I still have. I sold the coat, which I wish I hadn't, stupidly, but I kept the waistcoat and I sent you a picture, I think I sent you a picture of it. Um, and it's 1770, a typical embroidered one um, of nothing special, but to me, it was beautiful because it was owning a piece of the past. And for yeah. me, and I'm sure for you, Neil, as a, as a, a social historian, um, it's wonderful to own these things that other people have had before us. Sure. The stories they could tell, you know? Absolutely. And that's what that early waistcoat represented for me. And I got it for a few pounds in a bag full of stuff at Christie's in London back in the early 70s. And I was absolutely <laughs> thrilled. <laughs> that's funny. That's glad. Good to know that you still have it, though. 
Uh, there's yeah. so many people, like you say, who who sell their early pieces that they collect, and then they they always seem to regret it. Mm. So I think what we'll do um, is um, go into um, if I can get it over the dark here. web, <laughs> the dark web of waistcoats. Yeah. <laughs> um, Be careful! Be very careful. <laughs> all right that? yes good love it yep and um i think we'll probably just talk about the different styles um any any info any thoughts that you have on them um i'll make any comments that i have and uh we'll just see where uh, this sort of takes us mm -hmm. well here we have a wonderful waistcoat <coughs> made of linen sleeve waistcoat with some Pretty amateur, I mean, I couldn't do it, but pretty amateur embroidery in the fashionable color of yellow. I think it's about 1710 to 1720, I think yeah. you'd agree, judging by the straight cut all the way down the front. And the very typical uh, pocket flat shape of that, that Baroque period. Yeah, that um, was the sort of clipped, clipped corners. Yes, <clears throat> very odd. Um, the embroidery pattern is very much like I've got in a snuff box, because as well as the clothing. I like all the men's accessories, Neil. So I've got 300 snuff boxes, pocket watches, walking sticks, shoe buckles. It's, it's just crazy. And uh, my Baroque snuff boxes have got pretty much the same design pattern. Um, uh, Jean Derain um, uh, was particularly good at, at doing this strange matching basket shape. And it's all the way down the front of the waistcoat, as you'll see. Um, so so that's, that's, that, I paid a lot of money for that because it's an early piece, as you can see. But it's, it's, I think it's a lovely thing. It's, it's almost quite vernacular because it's not court wear. It's not the best. I mean, it's something I think that's uh, quite, you know, almost domestic. Clearly, I mean, it's fine and it's embroidered. But coming down to us now, it looks quite comfortable and very much of its period. What's, what's interesting is um, after studying in, in different collections and uh, working in different collections, you know, I've seen a number of these early... 1700 to 1720 waistcoats uh, that are linen that are worked in yellow. Uh, oh, have you? Have you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, could I could think of at least four. Uh, I didn't know. So I don't know if it was a fad or something, um, but definitely there there is something going on with with guys wanting these sort of yellow embroidered waistcoats, you know, early 18th century. Mm -hmm. Um, and the ones that you've seen, are they European or any of them American? You know, um, I don't know, quite honestly. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, more than likely, they're probably either English or European. Um, mm. But uh, just interesting, you know, when, when you sent me this one, I was like, wow, another one of these yellow ah, embroidered, embroidered waistcoats. Well, um, I love to see the ones you have. Uh, this one, Neil, they've still got the pencil marks for the embroiderer. Oh, really? Embroiderer. That's cool. Yeah, yeah which is quite nice. And where yeah. they've missed, they've gone off the pencil mark and they've sort of fetched into their own strange territory. And it's typical with these two waistcoats, it has one button at the cuff. And these are yeah. more like ball buttons and then the, the flat ones that become later on. Yeah, um, very, you know, very early style button. Now, there's another one which I didn't send you, you know, which is sleeveless uh, 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 and no sign of having sleeves, which is um, the same linen like this, but it's embroidered in sort of cream silk. It's almost identical. Huh. And I got that from a dealer who, who thought it was much, much later than it was. So oh, I don't know what this is. And I was thrilled because it, but it's been altered to curve away in the 1740s. Oh, and it's cool. Really of the same, it's the same vintage. It's just been altered as time's gone by. Yeah, no, this is, this is uh, lovely. Um, I don't think I've, the ones that I have seen, um, if I can, I'll have to dig up the photos and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll send them to you. Um, Great. But, um, yeah, I, I've at least seen three or four of them. So, but very, very ah, cool. Glad to know that. I'm very, very fond of it. I, I love the Baroque period and everything about it. So that's just, just typical of, the, of its time. All right, let's see here. Oh, yeah. your, your trio here. <laughs> the, the, the big, the big bedded Baroque gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> These are pretty big <laughs> waistcoats. I and mean, they look like they're big. Are they pretty big? Uh, yes. Not the one on the right, uh, which, um, which uh, with the yellow back you can see, which yeah. I got in America, but it's from Britain. Yeah. <clears throat> I got that at the Charlie Whitaker sale some time ago. Uh, oh, the, yeah. other two, the other two I got in Britain, the one in the middle is huge really? um, for a man of that time. He's about a 44 to 46 chest, Wow, which is big. The one on the left is so t small, it can, doesn't fit onto the mannequin, as you can see. Yeah. And the mannequins are at a 38 chest. I've got smaller ones, which I'll put it onto. But I put them in there because I, I love the way they look together. Yeah. And when they were new, I mean, they're pretty splendid now, but when they were new in the 1730s, they must have really sparkled. 
Uh, unfortunately, the middle one, you'll see, Neil, has no buttons. <clears throat> so, so it must have had splendid buttons, which some person cut off, as often happens in these things. <laughs> a button collector, you know? There should be, yeah, uh, yeah. Must be a special ring and help for them, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> But they're still good examples of, of, the, of their age, the time of Hogarth, and I love them for that reason. Yeah, and they're just great curving lines on them, too. Mm. I mean, just fantastic. And they're weird, sort of almost, almost like caterpillars on the one in the middle. Very strange. Yeah, right. It's <laughs> almost like the, uh, uh, the sort of bizarre fabric that you see a little bit earlier than this period. Or yeah. it's like, you know, dinosaur plants and just weird shapes. And <laughs> yeah. It's a, a truly bizarre fabric. <laughs> But I think here too is another good example of some of these early pocket flaps um, that that we see on, on a lot of these waistcoats. I like it because they're they're, they're playing with them, really, aren't they, Neil? And yeah. eventually they they fall down to the usual the three pointed one that we're all very familiar with. But I like the early playful ones at the beginning when they're thinking should they be horizontal, vertical? Watch how many scallops, how many buttons beneath three, four, five, whatever. Um, yeah. I think most of these have got their buttons beneath the pocket flaps, I think so. One or two will obviously fall off during time, but uh, yeah, it's good when they survive. And the yellow back, as you know, is very typical for that period. It was, it was very fashionable, especially in the, in the 30s and 40s, and perhaps even earlier, looking at the yeah. waistcoat we began with and the ones you've seen. So for the, maybe for the first half of the century, yellow was the, the, the color, the a la mode color. Is it, and yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's a worsted, correct? It is. Yeah, yeah. Holds that color so well. Mm. Beautiful. Now these are these just all are they all silk or is they are they silk and metallic uh, fabrics? The latter, silk and metallic. Oh, they are metallic. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah all, so all of them. E even to imagine then, you know, those bright, shiny uh, metallics, you know, that are now mm. sort of dulled down with with uh, yes with time. But which, which, as as you know, as we all know, if you look beneath the pocket flaps or all the all the hems, you'll find uh, the original color, and you just get a hint of that on the one on the right with the yellow back. Uh, you can see, yes, uh, the one with the pocket flap that's turned upwards a bit to catch the light. Yeah, I think uh, I think you have a photo of it here in the next slide or two, so oh, okay, you'll good. be able to see that, yeah. But yeah, it's a mixture of metallic and woven, as you can see, and uh, with velvet. Incredibly wow. costly textile, it must have been a fortune for this guy. Yeah, pretty, pretty amazing fabrics, you know, and, and, you know, as you know, you know, it's nearly impossible to find anything like this today. Oh, my lord, yeah. And if you could, it would bankrupt you wouldn't it yeah. unless it would then i mean it's in a way there's no difference <laughs> yeah this this waistcoat too uh, on the screen here is um got some really great buttonholes as as well and these are these uh very large um uh what what i think are probably referred to as vellum buttonholes in many cases as they mm -hmm. are often on the antiques um pieces of vellum are inserted underneath of the buttonhole and then they're sort of using um, metallic threads and then they sort of couch them over top of it. Um, but they make these very large and distinct buttonholes that we see. I mean, we see them all through probably the 1770s and some of the high-end things, but um, you know, it's very distinctive at this point in time um, in the 1720s and 30s. And distinctive and also universal for, for, for the rich. Oh yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Um, I know it came from Britain, but that's all I can tell you. That's what the auction catalogue said. But I yeah. mean, it was Dick Session, Dick Session from an American museum. You guys in America have a very different view towards Dick Sessioning than we do here in Europe. For us, it's a lot, lot harder. So for me, going to America has been a goldmine. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing them back home. <laughs> Liberating them. So yeah, here's a great uh, image of um, underneath that pocket flap that you were, that you were talking about. Um, and it's good to note on this one, that sort of triangular opening, um, mm. you know, prior to probably the 1760s, uh, in, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, definitely by the 70s, we started seeing this transition. But because the pocket flaps are so squarely put on and they don't necessarily cut, they don't sort of sway back as much as, um, as they will later, they tend to have these triangular openings, uh, which, yes. is, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> Yeah, it was sort of V-shaped like we've got here, and later on they become curved. Yeah, well, and then, then of course straight. But it's always a sign of an early waistcoat that that the triangular shape we're looking at here. Yeah, yeah. yeah and another thing too to sort of folks when they're trying to identify things is is the buttons. I mean, ten as you can see on this one with these great um, sort of work buttons on it, um, uh, they tend to be very very sort of rounded. 
uh, mm. you know, have a high dome to them. And so, and you typically see this on, on the, on those earlier waistcoats. Um, they, they, they generally have that sort of very, very, very high dome, uh, to them versus the later ones where they just essentially get flatter. Yes. Yeah. They're lovely things in themselves. Beautiful. Good for those. And buttons. this one, of course, has buttons all the way, button holes and buttons all the way down. Of course, the, the one we began with didn't. Those buttons stopped yeah. at, at the fork, which, of course, they can do even, even early. They don't always yeah. have to run down the bottom. But most of the time, it's an, it's an indicator, too. It's an, a rough guide. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and two, since we can see underneath the flap here, uh, that great twilled silk um, that we see on all of these 18th century menswear garments that we just really can't find anywhere today. Mm. Um, but generally, the lining of, of, of the waistcoat body will match the lining of, of the uh, pocket flap as well. Yeah, yeah. And there you can see, because I've opened the flap up, Neil, you can see how bright it was. Yep. Uh, the whole thing was originally. It's, yeah. uh, and how it's dulled down the rest. No wonder it's such an old, old piece. But my God, it's pretty good now. And I think in its day, when that man walked into the room, he could be the most boring person on earth, but he'd look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's essentially a cloth of gold, you know. It is. With, uh, with, yeah. silk, <laughs> with some yeah. silk bits woven into yeah. it. Uh, yeah, exactly. pretty, pretty amazing piece. And, there's, and there are several of these early weight style waistcoats around, too. Um, I, I, think, I think they, they, they survive because of their, their beautiful textiles. Mm. Yes, they're not rare. They're, and if you find them, they're expensive. There's no yeah. question. Because people can tell. Anyone having such a thing in his or her collection or to deal with as a, as a dealer would know what that is. You know, yep. you're not going to. You're not going to pull the wool over someone's eyes, not with something like this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, you pay for it. But I, was, I went across determined to get, this is a cloth of silver base. I like wow. the other one. Um, and again, you've got the worked buttonholes, as you mentioned, and that incredible textile, it's just staggering. Um, yeah, and you can see here uh, on the screen um, some of the uh, um, vellum, or sometimes we, we, Mark and I, when we were looking at waistcoats, when we were back over in the UK years ago, Maybe it was even this one. Uh, it appears that there's actually wood splints that were put underneath the buttonholes to support those metallic threads. And you can kind of see them uh, underneath that. Um, yes. From the, the bottom up, that first full one that you can see uh, some areas there. But, uh, but it could be vellum as well. And in this case, they're sort of wrapped around, put onto the buttonhole, and then couched down on top of that. So I, I, I really think you could probably go to a store in the 18th century and just buy them. Uh, you know, for your, and the tailor would then just you know, put them on their put them on their waistcoats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one's been was used for theatrical purposes. So the back, um, although original, has been cut open and machine sewn up again, and they monkeyed around with it. But yeah, it happens. It happens <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, lovely piece. Oh yes. Yes, and again, you've got the nice curvy pocket flap, very yeah. a sensuous line, very, very typical of the age. Um, it swirls rather than in that classic Baroque way. Mm. Yeah, great fabric. Yeah. I've got one that I haven't shown you a picture of. In fact, I don't think I've shown it to you, Neil, when you're over or I'll send you a picture. It's a French one from the 1730s, and it has got massive skirts with lined with buckram. And it's got, I think, what you said about the wood beneath the, the strips of wood beneath the um, pocket, yeah. uh, sorry, pocket holes, uh, button holes. That French one has got it in spades. Oh, wow. and, um, yeah, I'll send you that because it, it's, 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 um, it stands up on its own. It's an amazing garment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's quite fragile now, but um, I'll send you a picture so you can see it on the time yeah, before you can come and see it. Yeah. Now, oh, these, now yeah. These, these two are favorites. What classic English, we could be looking at French fabrics. Now we're looking clearly at England. Uh, as you would know, um, snuff colored or tobacco colored, so they call it. <clears throat> the one on the left, let's talk about the one, the longer one. Yeah. What's exciting about this, I've got a story here, I have to behave myself, um, but this was sold with the man's shirt, and I didn't get it. I was the underbidder, and I didn't pursue it. And th this was worn by Abraham Flint when he married Priscilla Marsh on Ju July the 15th, 1742. Wow. It has provenance. And the shirt and the waistcoat have been together ever since 1742. Uh. And some dealer, who I shall not name, bought them and split them up and sold them separately. Mm. And that, to me, that's another ring of hell for them to endure. <laughs> because <laughs> they've been together so long. And yeah, you yeah, and it's terrible. Are, that that is shirts. terrible. These early shirts, Neil, as you know, with the one I've got, it's, it hands to. Um, yeah, but I, 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 love, I, love that, I love that waistcoat. And to know the exact day that he got married in, 
um, and where his graveyard stone is. And I'm, when this knockdown's over, I'm going to go and pay a little little pilgrimage to go and see where the chap's buried. Where is it? But it's um, it's in Kent, in Ashford, in Kent. Oh. So uh, I'm in Surrey, so it's not not far from me. But I mean, how typical both of these are, 1742, and I think the one on the right, the, the shorter one, I suspect is sort of 1750s, you might agree, that sort of time. Yeah. I would say. And they um, have wool sleeves, don't they? They have wool sleeves, exactly, and woolen backs, wool sleeves. Wow. Um, just, just lovely. Um, the, the, I think, yeah, one of them has got what they might call bombazine, a sort of cloth of silk and worsted mix. Mm. Uh, I, th I think that's the, the longer one. I can't remember now. But the sleeves are definitely wool. And of course, you've got the typical cuff bits that show beneath a man's coat cuffs. You yeah. see the silk at the, at, the, um, at the wrists. But he's not going to spend money where it's not seen. So that's why the backs and the sleeves, of course, as we know, are of plainer, inferior fabric, generally speaking. The, um, it, I think, <clears throat> uh, and you t tell me if I'm wrong, but the, uh, the shorter one looks like it's woven to shape. Is that true? Or Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. What about yes. the other one? Is it woven to shape or is it just a textile? It's a text. I think it's a textile. Yeah. I love that, uh, how it's double breasted with the buttonholes put on the yeah. on the ends of each other, or the buttons put on, on the ends of the buttonholes. Mm, uh, exactly. So cool. you, you've seen quite a few Hogarth illustrations and paintings. Yeah. Of yep, absolutely. And what funky pocket flaps too on that long one. Yeah. And even though his coat would be single breasted, the waistcoat is double breasted. Yeah. And yeah, the pocket flaps are, are, are great on the, on the longer one. It's, a, just, it's just a great piece. And such a, a nice, subtle English, it could be also, you could say, American. A nice Protestant colour. It's not a Catholic colour, yeah, <laughs> is <right>. it? <laughs> <laughs> it's more sober and God-fearing. <laughs> yes, and the back, that's fantastic. I love the backs, especially the one on the right, that short one on the back. It's um, beautiful, the way those pocket, the, the, the side flaps swoop around there yeah. on the back. Gorgeous. Worth so, an elegant position. So much fabric. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you can definitely see the back on the longer one is is uh, some type of worsted. Yeah, could could be blended with silk or. Uh, yes, I think it is by the feel of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the one on the right has got it's really stiff, and those those um, side flaps are huh. really stiff, Neil. Actually. Really? Yeah, there's something in there. Um, card. Um, um, I'm not oh, quite sure what I can remember. Yeah. Yeah. But I love how you know they're they're just putting. Um, the more expensive textile on the back, just in case you got a glimpse of, uh, of it through the coat skirts. Which, very, when, very which one you walked, you would, you would do, wouldn't you, perhaps? Yeah, 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 very, very typical for, for, for any waistcoat, really, you know, no matter what period we talk about. Yes, don't why spend the money where no one's gonna see it, except, you, except your, your valet and your, your wife or mistress. <laughs> <laughs> but lovely, lovely things. Oh, there we go, look at that. Yeah, wow, there the you waistcoat. go, yep. Mm. And so these waistcoats, um, as we're talking about, were, were actually woven to shape. And so what they're doing is they're weaving these on the loom, you know, in a straight long pattern. Uh, and then they would, um, you know, cut them out to the shape itself. Uh, so pretty, pretty technical um, mm. uh, in terms of the weaving aspect of it. Um, but at the same time, you know, for, for the tailor who's putting it together, they got to know how to make any adjustments um and still make it look good yeah there's a few more woven to shape coming up the french ones very oh typical. right yeah i think yeah. I, I think i have them in here yeah oh that's nice too yeah that, yes now that those skirts are really quite heavy they've definitely got some um, cat interlining in there uh, it's impossible to tell what it is because it's in quite a good condition on the inside so you can't see what's there yeah not, not yeah much, but, you know you get the feel that there's something definitely going on to give it the stiffness that, that, that was required at the time yeah, and as Mark and I had, had mentioned, it's woven to shape. You can see here on the corner, uh, down here at the bottom of the skirt, that uh, that, that corner section was was designed to be that way uh, on, on this waistcoat. Very cool. Mm. The Dragon sort of fish back. scale thing, quite typical too, isn't it? That fish scale design, which is yep. the ground of the, of the silk. Yeah, yeah, the scales, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like the ones you see in the, in the, in the Francis Heyman paintings or Arthur Debus, isn't, isn't it? When yep. they, you know, yeah. You've got a, a cloth coat, Neil, with a matching breeches, and the waistcoat's the only thing that carries the colour and, and, and design in that yep. typical English Protestant British way, I would say. Yep, and, and, and we see that too uh, with, with many Americans. Yeah. Now this one, it looks like there's probably um, woolen death head buttons on there, or worsted death head buttons, rather. Yes, uh, yes, worsted, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the, the silk ones have such a high sheen to them, 
Mm. Um, the, the, the worsen ones kind of are a little bit duller, which I, I think are Yeah, nice. these are quite utilitarian, uh, on a wooden core and then wrapped yeah. around. Yeah. Uh, nice. That's crazy. That's a great, great pocket flash. Jeez. <laughs> Unbelievable. What great shape, too. Yeah. As you said, there's double buttons. It was really, I haven't got one like that. That's the only one in which has a double row of buttons. Yeah, I've seen in the, in the, in the 1780s, in late 70s. Well, later, later I have, but this yeah. Period, yeah. yeah, I've seen a few on, on I was going to say there's a few on coats um, uh, that I've seen, but yeah, this is certainly one of the one of the earlier ones that uh, that I've ever seen. But look at those pocket flaps; those are so crazy. I know. I just wish I had the shirt. I cannot. One of those things. Any collector watching this will think, "Yes, I've got some similar stories to Mark's. That things that you, <laughs> the ones that got away, you know, like a great fisherman, the one that got away, the things that you sold to pay a gas bill, or that you couldn't, you, you were the underbidder, or you just were asleep on the right, job." Yeah. And. I, I would have given a lot to have had that shirt with it. I just didn't. But when these auctions come up, in, in, at least in England, Neil, it's, you, you, I've already got meetings planned months in advance with yeah. my clients, so I can't take the time off to go. So sometimes I get people to bid for me. Zach very kindly has bid for me once successfully. Um, but, or you leave a commission bid, and someone yeah. goes beyond that. So, you know, you, you can't have everything. I can't afford everything. I cannot display everything. I cannot look after <laughs> everything. I've, I've got to be content with what I've got. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the hope is that eventually that shirt will turn back up and at least you know what it looks like. Yes. Um, and so, so hopefully at some point those, those two garments can be, uh, can be reunited. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, what, a, what an incredible waistcoat, man. Mm. Good. I'm glad you approved. Oh, now these two, I love these two, which I got them linked, <laughs> linked arms strolling down the, down the street. <laughs> The one, the pink one, the pinkish one with the silver, came from a sale when Castle Howard, the great stately oh, home yeah. in the north of England, in the early part of this century, was selling the costume collection to repair the roof. I mean, obviously, with a house that big, you've got lots of expensive repairs. And so when the new earl took over and his father had died, or the Jew, I forget who it was, um, <clears throat> he sold his dad's costume collection. And so Stephanie and I went up with many people to buy incredible things in the sale. Yeah. And from this sale, I got my own wig which I've shown to you guys in CW, to mm -hmm. Betty, Betty Myers, and she loves it. It's yeah. very rare for the man's wig of the 18th century. Very well, rare. and that pink waistcoat is, is lovely. Um, the green one with the gold came from tenants in Yorkshire, and um, where we had our exhibition, Man and Boy, early this year, 2020. Uh, and, um, and, um, and the person cataloging it didn't realize that in the time, the backs and the weight and the sleeves were made of inferior stuff, as we've just mentioned, because yeah. of course, why spend the money when it doesn't show? And so, they had written replacement back and sleeves. I thought, oh, these are not replaced. This is, this is the real McCoy. Um, yeah. And it's a beautiful thing. It, it is mint. The pink one's got a bit of stain on it and has shown a bit of wear. But the green and gold is, is just mint, as if it's never been worn. Hard wow. metal. Yeah, that, that's, those are pretty incredible. I think the 1750s, would you agree? That sort of time? Yeah. Like this, into yeah. early 60s, that sort of time. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that, and that really broad lace is just so characteristic of that sort of mid-century time period. Yeah. Lovely things. Oh. Yeah. They went, went to town with that pocket flap. <laughs> right. That's a real unusual shape by this, by this late period. You wouldn't expect oh, yeah. something. In the mid-century, you wouldn't expect something so, so extravagant, really. But it is. Yeah, and I wonder if they're doing that um, just to kind of show off that lace or even, even the workmanship of the tailor to be able to sort of miter all those corners. Um, mm. It's like, why would you do that to yourself? But um, obviously somebody who, who knows what they're doing. Yeah, you see that quite, quite a bit in uniforms at the time too, don't you? Yeah, yep, absolutely. The pocket flap outlined with that incredible um, thick lace, as you say. Amazing. Yeah, just, just giant. Mm. And it's unusual because it does up the back. I've got a few in my collection, but that's generally unusual <coughs> with lacing up the back. With its original lace, by the way. Wow. Mm. I think it is. Yeah, it's funny, you know, it depends from what collection you go to, but you, know, you certainly see quite a few waistcoats that do lace up the back. And I think a lot of that is just um, the, the tailoring technology. You know, they're, they're only using a two-piece body, so it's really hard to, to get that fit perfectly on some guys. Um, you know, when, once they start adding a waist seam in the 19th century and such, it gets a little right. bit easier. But, you yeah. know, at this point, um, it, it's a little bit harder with, with, with only those four panels. Right, exactly. Good point. 
Yes, yeah, so so not many of mine have lacing, although yes, I mean I would say that that's that's less usual than the than the fitter to shape or and later the the tape dies at the back. Yeah, but it's it's great it's great that it has it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, silk back on this one, huh? So yes, yes, that's a, that's a little unusual, don't you think? It is. You see, because he's got this. Um, yeah, he's he's not. He's uh, doesn't he's quite cavalier about his money. He just doesn't mind. <laughs> he he knows like someone having known they've got nice knickers on. They know, and he knows that he's got a <laughs> waistcoat. The, the back's pretty fine as well. Huh. And I forget what it's lined in. I forget it's probably lined in silk. I would I would think the usual thing. Yeah, uh, I would think so. I cannot remember. Um, and there's your sort of usual usual one button at the cuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do any of your, your waistcoats with sleeves have uh, those tape ties that sometimes you see on the insides to help pull the sleeve through the coat, coat sleeve? No, 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 yeah. no, Sometimes if you look on the top, you might find the remnants of it, but there's a number of, of ones that I was able to see in the UK in uh, uh, public collections that um, just sort of like right on the top, um, there, there's a ribbon or remnants of a ribbon to, to hold on to to kind of pull the sleeve through um uh, good you know i never i did not know that good Lord, yeah. learning something new every day tell me again let's bring the waistcoat sleeve down so it doesn't ride up the arm yeah just mean? so you know when you're putting your your sleeve on uh and you're pulling yeah. it through your coat sleeve you're just holding it so it pulls the sleeve through it huh and so where's that ribbon at the top of the wrist would you say yeah it's sort of the top of the of the uh of the um of the sleeve yep on the inside well, do you know i Either I've never seen that, or I never knew what it was and never thought to question it. That's, but I, <laughs> well, I don't think I have any. Wow, that's that's. Thank you. Well, it's worth to go back and check. It'd be interesting yeah. to see. If you, see thank if you, Neil. No, no, I love to learn new stuff. Always do. Yeah, great. Wow, that is yeah. just amazing. That is beautiful. Yeah, you know, it's Gorgeous. William and Mary colors, so maybe it needs to come to Williamsburg. <laughs> Could do. Could do. Wow, Look at that shape. It's just perfect shape. Very, very simple, but very elegant. Yeah, yeah, incredible. The pocket map's a lot, lot more normal, isn't it, by this time? A lot more yeah. what you would expect. You know, and again, here you can see that typical worsted back, worsted sleeve. Yeah, um, yeah just a, a fantastic um, um, waistcoat. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really one of my very favorites. Because look at the condition and the color, that sort of apple green with the gold. Yeah. And the buttons, uh, if we'll see in a second, the buttons, those ball buttons, it, uh, Work of art again. Yeah, but small there. But yes, they they are the staggering things, and not a single one missing, which is very good. Wow. Yeah. Yes, that lovely shape on the sleeve on the cuff. It, it's a satin, sat, silk satin. Yes, yeah, satin silk satin exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was really worth the trip. <laughs> mm. Now here's one, <clears throat> you see that funny stain, that funny patch on the, uh, yep. as you look at it on the left hand side, that's where the person selling it had written the price and stuck it on a sticky label onto, oh my God, that's what that is. <laughs> I brought that in as a, just to show you how these things can suffer and all we collectors out there have to put up with such things. They've been used for the theater, they've been used for fancy dress, mostly in the 19th century, or someone is selling it with a label on it. <clears throat> but a rather lovely thing, I think. I love the serpentine sway of the um the ribbon decoration as well going all the way up the front very it's, nice it's ribbon not embroidery uh well it's a ribbon embroidery i should say yeah i'm using ribbon in the term loosely it's not actually ribbon but it's a ribbon like it's serpentine yeah, um, yeah i think i think if we get up close i can't remember if i put one in there but it has little um sequence payettes uh, uh, on, on on silver on a silver river as it were it's i like it because it's very uh, rococo but this time yeah, the flowers yeah. are smaller, and they're all over the breast, and then you've got this the ribbon-like serpentine thing going up, running up the front. Any history? He was, a, he was a big guy. This is a size size 40, 42 to forty four chest. Wow! Yeah, that is big. Yeah. English? Uh, yes. Yeah. Nothing much else to say about it, I think. Really. Oh, there we go. Yes, yeah, nice buttons, and there you can just see what I'm saying. You can see the. Sequence. Oh yeah, it's like a braid. Catching the light. Yeah. It's really well worked, though. I just love it. And again, I, I, mean, I can imagine him teaming that with a cloth, a plain cloth coat, plain yep. matching breeches, most likely, although it doesn't have to be. And that's the thing that carries the color and the individuality is, is the waistcoat. Wow, that's pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. Interesting twilled silk. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing. Slightly faded, as you can see, but then that's, that's what you would expect. Um, 
But it's, again, it's getting harder to find these things as a collector. And if you do yeah. find them, they can be very poor condition. And even then, there'll be a lot of money. So certainly the days of getting these things cheaply, unless you're extremely lucky, have actually yeah. gone. It happens. <laughs> now, this, this is, is great. so funky. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this? This is a wedding waistcoat. It's amazing. It doesn't have any pockets, you'll observe, at mm. all. You've got turtle doves flying with linked wedding rings and baskets of flowers. And what do you think? About 1790s thereabouts? Probably. Yeah. The, the Victorian Albert Museum wanted to borrow it, or wanted to borrow it for an exhibition they had on wedding clothing. Although in the end, that didn't come true. <laughs> uh, but it's a fantastic waistcoat. I've never it seen anything like that for 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 a for a wedding, or indeed anything else. Um, no, but it's, tar it's tarnished now. I mean, all the embroidery needle is done in, in gold, which unfortunately, unlike oh. the green and gold we just saw, has tarnished a lot. And so it now looks yeah. like brown. In fact, it's gold. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Have you, um, is there any history with this one, though? Any associated No, with no, unfortunately not. And that's such a shame. You know, how rare the provenance is to find that. It makes anything more valuable uh, in, in every sense. So I don't know who he was, um, anything about it. Yeah. Yeah, a nice, you know, going into the 1790s here, I, I may have uh, <laughs> flipped a few of these around. We were kind of going chronological, but, you know, really tall collar, double-breasted, you know, mm. uh, kind of the typical for that, for that period. Uh, and before we just go any further, Neil, <clears throat> I've got another wedding uh, waistcoat that's white, um, typical for a wedding in the, in the 90s or 1790s, and it's cotton, and it has embroidered in white work turtle doves and wedding rings again, linked wedding oh. rings. So it's, it's similar to that one, but it's not, it's, it's white on white. It's not as fancy, wow. but it's, it's lovely. So again, the motif of the linked wedding rings, charming. Very cool. Yeah. There we go, some of the details. Yeah, there, yeah. Imagine that being brighter gold. Yeah. With the flowers in the basket. Yeah, the purple flowers, wow, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I wish I knew about him and what he wore and what she wore and where they were. And, Good luck to him, you know. <laughs> I tell you what, if I if my ancestors got married in such a thing, I would not sell that. I'd keep it. But this is good. I, I put this in because of my my great affection for your country and for the colonial period, about which I, for an Englishman, I know a fair bit, having worked at CW all these years. I thought for people watching this video, uh, this 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 chat, Neil, they might like it because it's plain linen, as you can see. It's some timber work embroidery, yeah, or cruel work embroidery, and it's, it's something I can imagine being worn in America as well as at home in, in England. It's a nice, quiet, domestic piece, I would say. Yeah, and you know, by, by the time that this, this style is sort of coming about, there, there's a lot of, um, you know, published patterns that people could, could purchase and, um, and then you know, embroider themselves if they wanted to. Very simple patterns. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, you, you might find this pattern turn up in the ladies' magazine or, mm. or, or something that, um, that was then copied onto this waistcoat. But it's nice to see a later waistcoat that's linen uh, with embroidery on it, and not and not a silk one. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Seventies, thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. I love this one. Now, this is different. I think slightly early. Do you know <clears throat> when this was sold? I then saw at a different sale uh, a woman's dress with exactly the same decoration. Oh. Is that amazing? Wow. Um, beautiful, bright colored, very simple, cruel work there. Um, but again, just a lovely, quiet, I would say domestic piece. Definitely yeah, yeah. English, British, you know, all could be American. But look at those flowers, those, those rosebuds. <laughs> nice work. Very nice work. Very simple, simple linen thing. Yeah, it's funny when you, you know, when you look at the um, pieces that are, um, that are sort of um, uh, professionally done, they, they just kind of mm. have a completely different uh different feel to them you know these, they do don't they yeah these these yeah. seem to you know like you said have more of a um sort of a domestically made or you know, not as professional i mean they're they're well yeah. executed it's but, well done but it can be yeah. done by his wife or his daughter you know very sure. very likely sure i mean it's certainly, it's certainly nothing you'd wear at court i mean it's very much or even to church on sunday yeah? more of a domestic thing in my my opinion i love the buttons too the way they carry on the the design and the color yeah. yeah, the uh, the last one that we were looking at. I'm just uh, catching up on a, a question here from Henry Cook. Uh, oh yes, hello Henry. Hi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, he's a fine he's a fine collector. And, and oh yeah, Henry's got some, some wonderful things. Is that um, is is that done directly onto the fabric, or was that um, like a tape that's applied? 
I think it's done. Uh, that's a great question from Henry. I think it's done on the fabric, but it's downstairs. And after this, I'll check and I'll, I'll let you. Okay. <laughs> well, we can post it in. Uh, yeah. In the, in the query. Section. I can't remember. I mean, they're all downstairs. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'll find out. Now, okay. Now this is great. This was worn <clears throat> for the coronation of George III. Wow. From seven, um, 1761. Um, by a lord, but unfortunately, Neil, in the pocket, you've got a vellum strip of paper and the original 18th century handwriting, and it's in indecipherable now. I've tried with the strongest light, with magnifying glasses, anything I can think of. And Lord, it says, worn at the coronation of George III, Lord, and then I can't read his surname. But it's an earlier waistcoat, I think you'll agree, than 1760. I, so I think this is the, the, the Lord. It could have been his marriage waistcoat, because blue and silver is quite general for a for some early 18th century weddings, white coats and blue waistcoats, I've noticed a fair bit. Not, it's not a uniform, but generally speaking, that seems to be a favor for bridegrooms. So my suspicion is, and my guess, this, this is his best waistcoat, and he wore it um, when he went to, to, um, to the coronation. Wow. Um, oh, worst it back to this one, or is that silk? No, it's silk. It's oh, silk. wow. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful garment. I love that kick of the, of the side vent there, this, this, the flap. Um, then it's, it's all silk satin throughout the whole thing. Wow. And that cost me 50 pounds, which is, I got it in a car park at a reenactment fair. So that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Some reenactor said, Mark, you collect old, old waistcoats. I said, yes, I do. He said, well, I got oh, something. Come meet me in the back lot. We'll have a coffee and I'll show you in the car park like a sort of drug deal with waistcoats. <laughs> <laughs> 50 pounds, absolutely worth every penny. I was thrilled. I just love this thing. It's so elegant. You know, there's so much that sort of survives from that from that coronation. You know, there you know just a lot of clothing. I feel. Um, I think it was you know, when when I was in the UK for the first time. Um, oh, geez, almost 15 years ago now, I think, or 12 years ago. Um, Mark and I had a chance to go up to um, the costume galleries at Nottingham, which I don't mm. think are there anymore. I think that no, not collection. unfortunately, no. Yeah, I think that collection has moved. But they had an incredible um, set of clothing. I think it was Lord Middleton. Um, and it was, uh, you know, the suit that he wore to the coronation. Uh, it was silk and gold woven, uh, you know, little flowers, as you would expect. Uh, with mm. Super wide, you know, like two and a half inch wide silver lace. All three, oh, really? Wow. All three pieces matching. But the cool mm -hmm. thing about it was, uh, when it was put away, um, they had taken, uh, put away in the period, they had taken paper and, and wrapped it over the lace and mm -hmm. stitched through it. And uh, it comes up in, in a bunch of um, sort of housewifery books and, and receipt books that one way to protect, pa one way to protect um, silver lace and keeping it from tarnishing is to cover it in paper. Um, so uh, obviously, and when you look underneath the paper, it was like as bright as day. Wow, um, it hadn't, hadn't, hadn't tarnished at all, but you know, I wonder whatever happened to that suit uh, or where it is now. It was just one of those just incredible, amazing, uh, amazing well, pieces. Yeah, I have a wedding um, favor from the wedding of, of George III and Queen Charlotte, and they're quite rare. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cockade, and it's got GC3 um, woven into it in gold, and then it's got really? flowers mm. worn in the man's hat and worn on a woman's bodice, you know. Yeah, what's a date to? Uh, 1761 is, is 61, was okay. the, the marriage. Yeah, was the wedding of George and Charlotte. There, look at that's, that's a very fine, almost like a like a Brandenburg there, that, that, or yep. a frog that decoration going on. Wow. And again, and you, you can see you can, you see, can see the si exactly. Shape. Yeah, you can see what's beneath the silver there, can't you? Because where it's where it's worn away. Yeah, oftentimes you see pasteboard or like cardboard. Sometimes it's vellum yeah. there. Yeah. And then some really cool death head buttons on uh, on this one. They sort of stepped variety, uh, yeah. Kind of like uh, some kind of Aztec castle. <laughs> <laughs> this is nice. now this is one in which the the back is as good as the front, which is yeah. very rare. At least very in my rare. opinion, in my collection, is very rare. <clears throat> and um, uh, rather lovely textile, as you'll as you'll see. I suppose. What do you think? The late eighties, early nineties. That's the yeah. time. Right? Thing. mid 80s perhaps i mean at, at the earliest i'm thinking but it's a, it's a really sweet little design in reds and greens um, double breasted as you'd expect um, welted pockets welted pockets deep welted pockets fairly high yeah. up as, as you'd expect yeah and again the collar can as i've done it there you can lie back or it can be upright under the ears 
Um, it's just it seems to be a, a, a choice in the in the eighties. This one I know that you like. You've seen this in the flesh meal, haven't you? Yep. You like this one? Um, yeah, pretty unusual. I mean, you don't. I mean, uh, we have in our collection at CW one waistcoat that's this late with sleeves, and it's just so unusual. Yeah. You know, I, I oftentimes think these are like old man waistcoats because they're cold. <laughs> yes, I think you're probably right. Um, yeah, because it's way out of fashion, and it's not a working garment. Yeah, a working. You'd expect a jacket or a working sleeve waistcoat, but not this. Not this textile. Um, pretty, Great pretty nice. Yeah, nice buttons. It's just a nice thing, really. And again, look at those typical pockets. Yeah, bigs, much different than the Victorian successes. Very different. <laughs> and they're not fiddly. They're definitely there. You can't miss them. And they certainly do love having these double pressed waistcoats starting in the you know seventeen eighties and nineties. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, very lovely. Now this, <coughs> I got this recently, I got this this year in Paris. And um, in Arlene Ribeiro's book on dress in the French Revolution, you'll, you'll know that she writes that the Jacobins who supported the monarchy, uh, often, and a brave guy, some of me, would strut the streets of Paris in black coats, black or yellow breeches, and red waistcoats. Oh. And this is from the Directoire period. So I'm, um, I'm just wondering if possibly this woolen waistcoat with the timber work embroidery work embroidery is worn by such a man and as usual they're saving the money because you'll see their the shoulder where of course he's not going to take his coat off so you're not going to see the fact that the wool right. doesn't run all the way up past the shoulder um, and so many waistcoats have that typical uh, money saving device you know just so rare to find a, a wool embroidered garment yeah i had to get this you can imagine why um in the, <laughs> Very cool. in the flea market in paris it's just fabulous um a few hundred euros but i thought well i have to have this because i didn't have one like it and to know that it came from France, possibly with that, that association, is very interesting historically. It's just a great, uh, great shape. You know, so rare to find wool that's not completely moth-eaten. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a lucky find. I couldn't believe it. But there's always good stuff to find in Paris. You just have to pay for it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Paris, too. Amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, unfortunately... Unfortunately, it's been washed, and you can see where the funny blue stalks there have slightly bled into the into the silk. Yeah. But what a bizarre! Anyone watching this, looking at this as we're talking now, I think will be as amazed as I am when you see these funny shapes. You would think that pattern's from the Art Deco period, wouldn't you? Yeah. Or something early twentieth century. It's so weird. These curious diamonds, or kite shapes interlocking, and then these weird standing stalks. And then, of course, you've got the fringe. And the Cunningtons in the Handbook of Costume of the 18th Century point out that white fringe was the rage of the 1780s. But um, I've got one of my four fringed waistcoats. One of them has white fringe. All the rest have got multicolors, like in this one. <laughs> and this is uh, woven this way. It's not printed. It's not printed. It's woven. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Just <laughs> weird. But they seem to love to do all kinds of strange, strange things like that. Strange in, things, in, yeah. In the 1780s and 90s. I think from a wearer's point of view, it's a stupid idea having pocket, welted pocket flaps with the fringe facing upwards because you're always going to get your fingernails caught in the fringe. And same with the, doing up your cravat, you know, or buttoning the waistcoat, you've got the fringe in the way. But um, I would love a white fringed waistcoat from the early 18th century, Neil, which you see in some portraits of some museum. Heavy yeah. gold or silver fringe. I've yep. never seen one for sale. Oh, but I would love that. For me, that's one of the missing links in, in my collection. And that, that fringing never goes down the chest. It starts, I've noticed, at the fork yeah. when, the, when it slides away, when it curves yeah. away. Yeah, I mean, you, you see them in the portraits, you know, I, but I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen one come to come about for sale. No, I never have in all my 50-odd 50, 50 years of collecting. Not that I'm aware of it. Lovely. Now, this is by Mays and Steer, you know, the Huguenot uh, weavers who settled in Spitalfields <coughs> um, after the, uh, um, in the late 17th century when Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes and kicked all the Huguenots out of, out of France. And many of them settled in, in England and brought their wonderful skills to, to, to my country, including the weaving. So Spitalfields, now very trendy, but until recent times, pretty poor area of silk weavers. And the Mays and Steer firm in the 1780s produces incredible waistcoats. I've got three, and this is, this is one of them. I just want to show you the beautiful pattern and the, the style of shape. There's one on display at the, at the V&A. Of course, any collector can have. You can, you can, these things are not that rare to find, um, I would say, because they produce a lot, and the pattern books survive in the Victoria Albert Museum. Yeah, I was going to say that that's how they're able to identify them, is that one pattern book that, that survives at the V&A. Yeah, yeah. But they're really kind of known for this sort of 
intricate ground with those sort of ribbon like um, uh, borders to them. But I, I, they're exactly. woven in, aren't they? They're woven, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Woven tape. Very cool. And, 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 and they're all the same. They're all like that. Single yeah. double breasted. There are variations on a theme, yep. I would say. Yep. This is a beautiful one. That's Again, nice, yeah. the, the flaps or the, the well, well pockets are sitting really high. Well, they are, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I put this in because I thought it might appeal to any, um, any of your people looking at this because it's nice and plain. It's a silk uh, with linen sleeves. So again, possibly because he felt the cold. I suppose it's 1770s, I would think, thereabouts, yeah. you know, yeah. sometime in the 70s. But just a very nice, simple piece. Nothing, else, nothing remarkable. Um, I can't even remember what the back's made of. The back might be linen, actually, and just the four parts of silk. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting here to note just, you know, one, how low the first buttonhole sits. Um, just kind of kind of funky. Um, hmm. And uh, also, you know, you would sort of think that a silk waistcoat would have sort of long, fashionable buttonholes. But in this case, it seems like they're, uh, they're a little long, not terribly long, but um, just enough to get that buttonhole through. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's quite a practical thing to wear at home, I would think, you know, fairly simple. Yeah, that's a, that's a great piece. You know, find, to me, finding the plain things is, is the hardest thing to find. But in, in many oh, cases, yeah. these were the, the usual sort of everyday, um, you know, kind of things that we would find most folks wearing. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Right, now, this is, I know this is, you're going to wrestle me and get this one, aren't you? It's get, <laughs> I know you're going to get your mitts on it. Some stuff. This is so strange. Um, to see this typical shaped collar or cape, as they would yep. call it, on a waistcoat, not on a coat. It's got that step away of the 1750s. Yep. I see a lot in portraits. Well, what's it doing on a waistcoat? It's clearly a waistcoat. It was never one. It was never ever a coat. Yep. As well, we, there's a, there's several Arthur Davis portraits that show this. Um, mm. At least one or two that come to mind. I can I can send them to yeah. you if you don't already have them. Um, but just a, a great. It's such a, a rare uh, survival, survival of, of this form, uh, but, but you do see it. But that means the coat has to be collarless, otherwise you'd have two collars go, going on together. Yeah, I, I have to go back to dig out that Divas portrait, but I think... So I. I've, I've got a book of his work, I need to have another yeah, look. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think the coat is collarless. Yeah. And well, it's a, made of, it's it's a fantastic woolen, yeah, raspberry wool. Uh, it survived very well with an incredible, um, as you'll see, glazed linen uh, uh, pocket, under the pocket flaps and, and in the in the four parts when you open up the waistcoat the, for the first bits, as it were, you know, before the rest of the back carries on. Typical that typical collar shape. Yep. Yeah, very rare, and a slanting pocket uh, um, buttonholes, as you'll expect too. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Oh, there you go. Oh, worse. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. This, I, I hoped you'd like because you know, I know that you like this garment, so I thought I'd include some pictures <laughs> of the details of this just to just to make you even more um, excited. <laughs> well, great buttons on it too, and you can see that button stand running down there that helps to reinforce those buttons that yeah. line the stitching. And then on the on the opposite side, you can see on underneath the buttonholes there that they have um, cut out these individual little pieces. Um, that would uh, could be taken out if if that section would wear out instead of having to unpick the whole waistcoat. Um, right. You know they're able to just pick out those little blocks and and then insert them. But you know, great. You know, get another material that we just cannot find uh, mm. anymore um, is this great glaze shalloon. Um, you know, it's a, it's a glaze worsted, very commonly found uh, in coats and waistcoats. Uh, but just impo nearly impossible to find today. Mm, uh -huh. Yes, I'm sure. Well, I certainly haven't found it. Gorgeous thing. That's oh, wool all the way around, nice. Wool all the way around, yes. Again, back of same as the front. So. And it, this was a big band, as you can pr perhaps see from that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, for the, for the time, unusually so. But not, not uniquely so, but unusual. I mean, he's a big chap. Um, I had to pad it for the, for the mannequin. Yeah, uh, so I think that's a sort of 44 uh, to 46 chest. Yeah, yes, I thought you'd, I'll put that in to show you then. The yeah. lovely curve there, it's very typical. And, and the lining of the pocket flap. Yep, that great, great uh, glaze. You see the, the light just uh, bouncing right off of. Beautiful, isn't it? 
this this I think Neil is a rare piece, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't think this style stayed around very long because it's very weird. Uh, but but it's nice to see that that here is an example of it, and we're not just dreaming this up looking at this portrait. Mm. Now, um, a shawl collar from the late 18th century, so I, I guess 1790, 1805, that sort of period. Uh, very rare in portraits and very rare in collections to see the shawl collar, which is, is an alternative to the usual stand for or stand yeah. collar and reveres and lapels. Um, and um, so I have provenance of, of this man, uh, who's a vicar, curiously, a very fashionable vicar who wore this <laughs> uh, in, in 1795. Um, and rather lovely. Again, the buttons very typical of the time, as yeah. you know, and a very great textile. <clears throat> with uh, you can hardly see in the picture, but very typically deep and broad welted pockets. You know, um, at least an inch, an inch deep, on the on really, the, uh, oh. really broad, double-breasted um, uh, waistcoat. I mean, sometimes you find them quite narrow, but this is really, really quite wide. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's clearly not Victorian. I mean, you can tell this is Georgian it's, it's through and through. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, we were able to acquire that great spotted waistcoat that's very, very, very similar to this one that was worn by Thomas Dodd. Uh, yes. That, that also has a straw collar uh, yeah, on it. I mean, exactly. it's, it's almost identical to this one. Well, your one's got, I think, gold spots, isn't it? I yeah. It. I, remember, yeah. I saw it at, at this preview. That yeah. was a great sale. And from that, you got that cloth coat, of course. Yep. Yeah, and I got yeah. some great things. I wish I bought more, but then you can't have everything. Yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing when some of those sales come up. It's just, you, know, you wish you can grab everything, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> All right, so this, is, uh, this series is the last, last ones that I've got for, for <laughs> this chat. Um, so I thought we'd end on one, another one of my favorites. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the story here on this one, Neil, is that in 1982, in, in the time of the new romantics, uh, the old costume house founded in 1790, Fox and Co. or Fox and Sons, was closing down. <clears throat> and uh, I went along, I was back from the, from the States for a holiday in, in England, knew about this sale and went with some friends to this. At this sale, any waistcoat was a pound, any pair, any breeches or pairs of trousers were two pounds, and any coat or jacket of any sort were three pounds. Oh my God, I had, I took tons of stuff to the reception desk and then I thought, oh, even though it's so cheap, I had a mountain, I couldn't afford the whole thing, but this cost me one pound. <laughs> and as you can see, it's a beautiful, typical everyday cloth waistcoat with incredible gilt buttons, of, yeah. I guess, of the, of the 70s around there, yeah. but for yes. a pound. And it's, it's, it had been used for the theatre, but luckily it hadn't been damaged too much. So obviously, at any stage in history, when you're running a theatre costume job, if you have to, a designer wants a suit, you just go and buy a suit. You don't need to make a suit, except maybe for the principals. And right. in such a case, when Fox & Co. was founded in 1790, if they're doing a play that's contemporary to them, it's very easy to get a waistcoat made in 1770, isn't it? Just go down to the right. second-hand clothes market in London, and you get, there you get it. So I think that was a very good buy. I got some others from the same incredible sale. A nice cloth back to it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it has, I believe it has a silk lining, if memory <laughs> serves. Yeah, a, a, a brown silk lining, I think. I can't remember, but yeah, that's um, that's very very lovely. Yeah, great buttons. Again, you can see here. We, you know, we've talked quite a bit about that button stand and that um, sort of top stitching that happens uh, on the other side of the buttons uh, on the left hand mm -hmm. side of the screen. Buttonholes are just functional. You know, they're not uh, super fancy. Not that long. You know, worked very long. You know, just just a nice. Good, as you said, workaday garment. Yeah, quite rare because you know the, the embroidered satin ones survive, but ones like this do not survive in such numbers. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, Mark, thanks. Um, what we'll do is uh, I will um, we'll, once we finish recording this um, at some point today, if I get a chance. Um, We'll get this recorded and put up on, on the YouTube channel. Uh, if there's any questions, we will uh, try to funnel them over to, uh, to you uh, to answer um, about your collection. Um, but I appreciate your time. Good seeing you. Thank you, Byron. And I would say that anyone watching this, if they're ever in England, they're welcome to come and see the collection. Because this is the tip of the iceberg, as you know. There's so much. <laughs> so and there's a, it's an invitation to anyone who, who, we all love the same stuff, or we wouldn't be doing this. In, watching this so yeah, they, there's an open invitation 
Yeah. Great. Well, we, I appreciate that and I'm sure everybody else does. And, you know, hopefully sometime soon here, we'll be able to come back over and uh, take, take a look at uh, some other piece in your collection. I'm thinking maybe um, we could do something on some of your shirts. Uh, I mean, right. I will say probably hands down one of the best collection of a truly 18th century shirts uh, out there. Um, I mean, there is, uh, there are so few of them around and, um, you know, uh, some of the ones you have are just you know, truly amazing. Oh, welcome. I, I recently bought Prince Albert shirt. I know that's outside your period, but it's actually <laughs> really, that's pretty cool. Dated 1854 with a wow. crown and the, and, the, and the A for Albert in blue silk. Uh, it's great. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'd love to, you know, um, let me know, Neil, it's great to see you again. I can't wait to see you in the flesh when this virus passes and I can get across the CW and see all my pals there and Mark and, and uh, Mike and all those good folks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's talk about it. Maybe in a few weeks we can do it. And, um, but otherwise, uh, thanks for your time. And, Thank uh, you, Neil. All right. And we'll uh, hopefully see you around sometime soon. Okay. Very good. All right. Take care. Goodbye. Cheers. Thank you.